Welcome to the Easter Sunday service at Bethany Congregational Church. Thank you to all who have sent in um, money to help uh, decorate our sanctuary with lilies and tulips. I also want to thank uh, Matthew Hughes for his work in decorating and to Phil Weinberger who has graciously um, been taping each week. I invite, you to invite all of you to join us tomorrow morning at 1030 for a Zoom fellowship. And if you're having any issues with Zoom or any of the meetings that we've had, please call or email the church office. With that in mind, let us worship together. This is the day when tears are wiped away, shattered hearts are mended, fears are replaced with joy. This is the day of the Lord. Roll away the stone of fear. Throw off death's clothes. Go ahead of us into God's future. This is the day the Lord has made. Death has no fear for us. Sin has lost its power over us. God opens the tombs of our hearts to fill us with life. This is the day, Easter day. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. O God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. 
We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people, even as we faithfully pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we normally share the peace of Christ by greeting one another. But while we are still apart, I encourage you to send a note, to make a phone call, or to send an email. Remind one another that you are still in your thoughts and prayers, that though we are apart, we are still together as one body in Christ. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Matthew should not be confused here with Mark or Luke, where the women come to the tomb with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. In Matthew, they do not bring spices, but come to see a verb that means not only to perceive visually, but also to gain understanding. When the women approach the tomb, it is with a sense of anticipation, of expectation. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning with verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, 
Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. My blessing be added to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Amen. Let us pray. By the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, be found holy and acceptable in your sight, O God, the one that we call our rock and redeemer. Amen. You and I know, perhaps all too well, especially now during this COVID-19 pandemic, as we await the worst, those days as Mary Chapin Carpenter's lyrics describe, it seems so black outside that you can't remember light ever shone on you or the ones you love in this or another lifetime. And that's when we really need to know what Easter is all about. That might have been how Mary Magdalene felt that first Easter morning. Mary had seen and been through a lot of tough times, but never anything as heart-wrenching as she witnessed on what we call Good Friday. For the one who was the first one to treat her like a human being, the one who had touched and changed her life, the one whom she had pinned on such hopes on, was dead. And not just any kind of dead, but crucified dead, humiliated, tortured, beaten, mocked, and nailed to a cross. Not too easy to get over such loss. It was so dark outside. Violence and fear hung like a dark cloud over her. 
The light that had once shone on her had been extinguished on a Roman cross. Where there had once been a glimmer of hope, there was only despair now. And while it was dark, she came to the tomb. There, in the darkness of her life, she was surprised by the light of Easter. And her story has become the Christian story. It is the story we remember. And though we are apart, we celebrate together today. It is the single most important reason we gather, even in spirit, any Sunday of the year or any day of the week. It is the heartbeat of Christian community. It is the hope to which we cling and the promise upon which we stand. It is the very essence of Christian faith. It is so much more than chocolate bunnies and jelly beans. So what is it all about? In the final analysis, it's all about life. For did you know that scientists have studied the mineral and chemical composition of the human body? And the chemical and mineral composition of the human body breaks down this way. 65% oxygen, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1% phosphorus, and less than 1% of potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, iron, and iodine, and trace quantities of fluorine, silicon, manganese, zinc, copper, aluminum, and arsenic. If we took all those parts and sold them on the common market, it would be worth less than a dollar. Now our skin is our most valuable physical asset. It's worth about $3.50. So add it all up, you're worth less than $5. But take a moment now and place your hand on either side of your windpipe. Go ahead, take a moment. Let's all be quiet and just feel. So what did you feel? I hope you felt your pulse. You feel the mystery of life beating through your five dollars worth of chemicals and minerals. Do you understand how five dollars worth of chemicals and minerals adds up to you? For Easter is about the power of life. The power that turns five dollars worth of elements into one of God's most priceless and precious children. Yes, Easter is that power that gave you that pulse, calling you by name and promising, promising you that even after our pulse stops beating, that isn't the end, but another wonderful beginning of life everlasting. And Easter assures us that eternal, Abundant life not only goes on forever, but that is, it is available to us even here and now. My friends, that is what resurrection is all about. Because we all have, and because we all know, that having a pulse does not guarantee a full life. One can have a heartbeat but no heart for living. An existence, but no energy. You see, we all know that we are worth more than five dollars. We know we are worth more, far more than the sum of our biological parts. And that more 
is what Easter is all about. You might call it meaning. You might call it peace. You might call it purpose. For St. Augustine called it the longing for God. The restlessness that only finds its rest in God. Paul Tillich called it the ground or the power of being itself. Kierkegaard called it the leap of faith that quells anxiety. And all of us seek it in one way or another. We want to know the more. We want to know God. At Easter is the Christian answer to that longing. It is knowing that death is not the end, and a pulse alone is not living. But if you're not sure exactly what that means, if you feel in the dark about that, you're in good company. For you see, Mary came to the tomb thinking death was the end for Jesus. She goes in the dark and is resigned to the finality of death. The sun had risen on that first Easter morning, but Mary and Peter and the others were still in the deep darkness of Good Friday. At first, Mary does not even recognize new life, even when it is right in front of her. But when Jesus speaks her name, she knows. Maybe you can relate to Mary. Maybe on this Easter 2020, you are resigned to the futility of life and the awful pain of death, the finality of death, perhaps death of a beloved friend or family member, perhaps the death that pervades our culture, tragic deaths that come as a result of COVID-19. Maybe one or more of these things has convinced you that not much makes sense in this life. And although you are breathing and your heart is beating, it is also breaking. There's been so much loss and sorrow in your life that you're watching today, not looking for life, but expecting to find more of the same more chocolate bunnies and jelly beans, some candy-coated cl cliches that don't touch the real questions of your life or bring comfort to your deep grief. Perhaps on this Easter 2020, you can relate to the men who came to the tomb after Mary's announcement that the tomb was empty. You have followed others, and looked into this whole Christian thing, and you just don't understand. You just don't see proof for such claims. But here's the great thing about the Easter story. The ones who come to the tomb don't see Jesus. They don't get any proof. They just go back home and continue to hang out together until Jesus appears in the midst of their dark night. And when Jesus appears to the disciples, he shows them his scars. They point not to his triumph, but to his tragedy. Not to his victory, but to a time when he was vilified, a time of pain and struggle. For let me point out something to you, my Good Friday friends. I believe we cannot understand or experience Easter unless we have been through Good Friday. Only when we have been where Mary was, where our heart was broken, our eyes blurred with tears, and our spirits crushed by grief, only then do we go from Good Friday to Easter Sunday? For Easter 
is not about covering up your scars or denying your wounds, but showing that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Nor is Easter a promise that you or your family or the church or the world will ever be the same again. It is a promise that the power that gave you a pulse will never abandon you. That same power is calling you by name, and despite all that we see around us, is still at work doing a new thing in you and in the world. Easter is the promise that nothing in your past has the power to define you. You are defined by the light of God that flows through you and flows through all creation, making all things new. You don't prove God's love. You embrace it. Nor do you prove God's power. You experience it. You don't prove life. You live it or prove new life, you receive it. Again, Mary Chapin Carpenter. And the voice you need to hear is the true and trusted kind, with a soft, familiar rhythm in these swirling, unsure times. When the waves are lapping in and you're not sure you can swim, well, here's the lifeline. This is love. All that ever was and will be. This is love. So put your hand on your pulse again. And just as your blood is pulsing through you, the life that cannot die is pulsing through all creation. There is a song in our hearts that cannot be crushed. And if we are open, we will experience resurrection many, many times. And that, my friends, is better news than chocolate bunnies and jelly beans. It is the reason, the only reason, for Easter. Alleluia. Amen.
And now let us come to a time of prayer. As we do, let us remember Sandy Johnson. I also ask you to remember the family of Reverend Alden Zern, who passed away this last week. Indeed, let us continue to also remember those first responders, and for the doctors and nurses, and for all those impacted by COVID-19. Let us pray. O oh God, it wasn't so long ago that we gathered together to celebrate the birth of Christ and reflect on the mysteries of the Incarnation, the way Christ emptied himself of divinity while at the same time perfectly reflected your image, how he entered the fullness of humanity with all of our joys and all of our sorrows. Through the muck and the mire, he proclaimed the good news of your love, even in the most hopeless of places. In this past week, we have witnessed as the worst of humanity rejected your gift of hope, putting Christ to death, attempting to deter the emergence of your kingdom, and the rush of your spirit as she erupts into the world. In those dark moments, we recognize the darkness that threatens our lives and the whole world. Loneliness and grief, humiliation and shame, illness and death, homelessness and hunger, divisions and war, hatred and oppression, violence and abuse. Within each of these realities, and in many more, we can identify our own stories. Pain and suffering are not abstractions for us. It is the common condition of humanity, shared even by Christ, all the way to the cross and to the grave. But on this day, O oh God, you have rolled away the stone and your light has pierced the darkness of the tomb. On this day, the hope that Jesus lived and died for has emerged even stronger than before. Baptized into death with Christ, we are being reborn into newness of life. Indeed, the whole world is being born anew as your kingdom bursts into fullness of your love poured out. We know, of course, that many of us still experience darkness in our lives. These struggles don't simply go away in the joy of this day. But we are renewed in faith and strengthened in hope. Even more, we have been reminded that the promise of Easter is not just an idea that we sing and pray and preach. That Christ is alive and lives among us today. Your real presence is more than something we hope for. You are with us here and now. We know you in the love we share for each other the love that binds us all together as one. So on this day, O oh God, Christ's resurrection gives us hope that nothing, no tragedy, no mistake, no sin, no evil, is beyond the redemptive power of your love. This is the truth of your kingdom, a kingdom we long for, and for which we pray. Give us the grace that we may be more than just faithful by praying in your name, that we may be faithful by also living in your name. Amen.
Now hear these words. The world says they thought Jesus was dead. They thought the cross was the end. They thought that when the stone rolled over the tomb, that was it. But we proclaim the dead are living, the cross is empty, the stone is rolled, and one word describes it all. Alleluia, Jesus is risen. The world thought death had had the final word. They thought those with power had won. They thought that when Jesus cried out, that was it. But we proclaim, the world breathes, the powers are defeated. The final cry was only the beginning. And one word says it all, Alleluia, Jesus is risen. The world thought the story was finished, that hope had ended. They thought that when the tomb was sealed, that was it. But we proclaim, the story has just begun. The hope is newly born. The tomb is empty. And one word says it all. Alleluia, Jesus is risen. So this is the news. Jesus is risen. This is the moment. Jesus is alive. This is the gospel. Jesus is with us. Alleluia, amen, and amen. Thank you.